Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Stig Brodersen, and it's the Berkshire weekend, and as tradition would have it, I'm thrilled to have invited no other than Manish Paprai to join us today. Manish, thank you so much for making time. Stig, it's always a pleasure, and uh, a year goes by so fast, and uh, it's wonderful to be back with you, and it'll be even more fun to be back in Omaha. It will. It, 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 it's absolutely amazing. And you know, whenever this goes out, this would be the, the Berkshire weekend, whenever that comes out. So people will listen to this on the way back home from the event or, or whatever they're doing at that point in time. And so, so let's jump into to the very first question. Um, Manish, you received a letter from no other than Warren Buffett the other day, and you posted it together with the comment, I must already be in heaven. So... I cannot help but ask, Manish, what did that letter say? Well, uh, well, uh, the letter, uh, well, first of all, I was floored. I was floored when I uh, got the letter because, uh, you know, Warren has been a a big fan of Dakshana for a very long time. I mean, I think the first time I met him in 2008 uh, for the lunch with Guy Spear, uh, I had sent him the very first Dakshana annual report uh, before the lunch. And he had read every word and uh, he has a photographic memory. So he's telling me like, hey, on page five, uh, there's an error uh, in your report. And I'm trying to remember like what is on page five, you know, but so uh, anyway, I was able to prove to him that there was no error. But but since then, you know, I've been sending him the reports and sometimes I'll get a note saying, send me 20 copies. I want to send it to my kids and the board and grandkids, whatever. And uh, he'd scribble a note, you know, this is wonderful, this, that, whatever, right? Uh, but but this time, uh, he he took the time uh, to actually write uh, a formal letter, which, uh, which you know, he, uh, Warren has got a lot of uh, things he could be doing with his time, you know? And, uh, and you know, like, I mean, uh, it takes a lot more time difference between scribbling a note and actually you know getting debbie and dictating something and making sure it's perfect and all of that and then sending it out i mean that's that's a you know good i'd say 20 minutes or something of his time uh so that was really uh surprising but basically he uh he has he expressed deep admiration for what has happened at dakshana and he forecasts that it'll continue to do amazing things and then, you know, I think uh, obviously Buffett is so humble. He says that, you know, uh, I think he said something like, uh, I'm glad that my annual report doesn't get compared to the Dakshna annual report, uh, which of course is, you know, uh, he's being facetious. I think the Berkshire annual reports are the ultimate standard we all try to aspire to. And then finally, he said that uh, it's it's an honor to even be quoted uh, in your annual report. And, you know, I mean, I have learned everything from Buffett quotes. Buffett has not learned anything from my quotes, you know. So so he was very humble. He was very gracious. And um, it really floored me. I can imagine that. That, that, must, be, that must be such a, such a wonderful uh, experience. Um, and, and, and well deserved. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here. You've been kind enough to send a copy to, to me. And it, it's an it's amazing read. So, um, yeah. If you if you want a if you want a good book re- recommendation from Buffett, uh, it's definitely worth picking up. Uh, so, Manish, you you have this uh, this wonderful story about you and Guy being giving a tour uh, of uh, Warren Buffett's office, and um, in this uh, in Bo- Buffett's office, you found this Japan's version of Moody's manual called the Japan Company Handbook. And at this point in time, whenever that's this happened, uh, Buffett was well into his eighties, so it wasn't about the money. Uh, the investment he would find in that book won't like move the needle, not that he would need that to begin with. And so you met Buffett multiple times and you're close to Charlie, who you played bridge with regularly back whenever you lived in, in California. Um, I have to ask, um, what do you think the driver is to continue doing what they do well into the 90s? Well, I mean, I think that it's kind of like, you know, Michelangelo or Picasso, you know, they love their art and uh, they're very passionate about their art and uh, they want to keep learning and keep improving. And, uh, and they're just uh, 
just uh, I think that if you if you pursue something that you are very passionate about, uh, by definition, you'll do it well. So both these both these guys have a very deep passion for Berkshire Hathaway for investing, for running businesses the right way, and associating with the right people, and you know exhibiting the right behaviors. All these different things, and um, and so I think for them it is uh, just about you know how well they can practice their art. Just like Michelangelo would be, you know how how amazing can I make the next statue or sculpture or painting and so on. So if if we can put the spotlight on you, uh, Manish, you know I I've, I've read your annual reports with absolutely uh, wonderful, and uh, you're very transparent about your net worth. And if you if you then read, I, I brought a few props here, which you can't see if you're listening to it, but you can see it on YouTube. And like, you, you are very transparent about your net worth. And whenever I read that, I was like, what is it like? Because people usually don't talk about that stuff for, you know, whatever reason. And so uh, you obviously, uh, not just because I think we all knew that, but you're obviously a very wealthy person, um, nine figures. And so I can't help but, is it the Michelangelo gene with with you, like why do you continue doing what what you're doing? You clearly don't need you don't have you don't need to pay rent. You know you can you can already do that with what you have. So so what's your driver? Well, I mean, I think all of us are looking for purpose and meaning uh, in life and something to make life um, you know the best the best that it can be and uh, make our days the best that they can be. And so you really want to pursue things that you are uh, excited about. And uh, so uh, for me, you know, uh, when I play bridge, I'm really happy. Uh, when I'm uh, drilling down on a possible investment, I'm really happy. Uh, when I'm reading a great book, I'm really happy. And when I'm interacting with uh, some smart, high quality people, I'm really happy. So basically what I try to do in my life is increase the time I spend on things that make me really uh, thrilled and happy and take down or eliminate uh, things that are, a, a, you know, a deterrent or a distraction from that. And so it naturally leads. Uh, so the uh, it's, it's not driven, it's not driven by money. You know, I mean, I mean uh, a very long time ago, I got to the point that I would not be able to consume the money I had. Uh, and enhance my happiness. I mean that that happened a few decades ago, and uh, so uh, I think for me the the pursuit was about how to how to leave the world a better place than I found it. Uh, how to try to practice the art of investing the best I can, and then you know when Dakshina started, I never wanted to actually get involved in a nonprofit. I really was trying to find a organization I could just give money to, you know, it's much easier to write checks. And basically I came up blank. I couldn't come up with a single organization on the nonprofit side that actually impressed me uh, in terms of how they did work. So I said, well, uh, I can't do suboptimal, right? So even though it's hard, I'm gonna try to do it on my own. And if it doesn't work, then I can always, you know, write checks and so on. And so far, it it worked, and I was able to. Uh, what was amazing about Dakshina is that I was able to translate the the model and the uh, you know the the way I thought a nonprofit should run into reality. I ended up with a really good team, really good leaders, and they were able to execute. Uh, of this, you know, utopian idea I had for how a nonprofit should be run, and amazingly, uh, it worked. And uh, I mean, it's worked very well for about 14, 15 years, and I think uh, it's likely to, likely to continue working. So it's been, I mean, on all fronts, it's all about trying to uh, make life interesting and uh, trying to add some value. Manish, whenever I um, I, I've seen you play uh, cricket uh, whenever you are at Dax and I, one of the canvases. But aside from playing cricket, um, are you a part of, of, of operations or is it more you know, writing the check? How much are you a part of curriculum? Like, what is, what is your more operational uh, role, if, if any? 
I am not involved in the management of Dakshana. And in fact, when I go to India, I spend almost all my time uh, with the students. I, I spend almost no time with the management and the team. Uh, you know, I, I am probably 90% of the time I spend, and, and it's not much. I mean, I like last three years, I've hardly been able to go to India because of COVID and so on. So, you know, uh, couldn't do much in terms of even interacting with the students. Uh, so my my role at Dakshana has been uh, one of providing direction. Uh, number two is uh, identifying and selecting the leadership. And uh, the most important uh, objective has been uh, to say no. So uh, I find myself saying no uh, to almost anything and everything uh, people propose to me. So my management team will come to me with, you know, uh, the government wants to do this or uh, this state government uh, wants us to take over this facility and do X, Y, Z or whatever else. And uh, Dakshina has done well because we say no to almost everything. So that part of it is very similar to investing because in investing also, you really have to be good at saying no, no to almost anything. And uh, so, uh, so the 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 role at Dakshina has to be ha, has been for me to stick to a very pure model of what a non how a nonprofit should operate uh, is to try to make that work in the real world, and it's really hard to make it work in India because, like for example, you know we uh, we will never pay any bribes. You know we will not even pay one rupee or one dollar by bribe to anyone ever. We've never done that. But um, many times in India, um, the government officials don't care that you're a nonprofit or whatever. Um, so like, for example, when we bought this large property, it has to go through a series of approvals. And uh, at each approval uh, point, it's standard to pay bribes to get that approved. And we couldn't. So. It took us years and years to get those done when it would have taken a few days or a few weeks. Uh, and we had to uh, eventually apply pressure uh, from some high level government officials uh, and such to try to move our case along. Uh, so that's been hard, uh, but we've been able to stick to our principles and we've been able to make it work, uh, but it's, it hasn't been an easy journey. And I think that's so admirable of you to do and, and to stick to those principles because there are also a big opportunity cost, which I'm sure you already thought about if you were to pay that 10 or $15 or whatever it is. I think you mentioned in one of your reports that you could have done something with very small amount, but then you would you would break those those principles. Yeah, all these bribes from an economic point of view and from a practical point of view, it would be a no-brainer to pay the bribe because it would just save so much time and it's really meaningless most of the time the bribes are like you know uh, less than a hundred dollars or less than a couple of hundred dollars and it causes us uh issues that cost us sometimes tens of thousands of dollars in in lost productivity and time and so on uh but but the thing is uh, that that would cause a major problem my management team and the entire team at dakshina is there because they know that Dakshina is such a awesome organization with such a great culture. Uh, we cannot we cannot cut corners on that culture, and uh, because I won't be able to retain those people. Then. And uh, so um, so uh, we just don't have a choice in the matter. I think that uh, it would just go into a downward spiral if we try to uh, you know cut corners on any of our principles. Uh, so uh, the integrities are integrity is really important. The other thing that's really important is the efficiency of our spending. Uh, that's another area that we are very, very careful about. We want very high social returns on invested capital. And these are, I think these are the things that Buffett uh, appreciated because he, he has direct uh, knowledge of the foundations run by his three kids uh, of the, of the Bill Gates foundation. And it's, you know, the advantage I have versus those four entities is I'm a lot smaller. And it's a lot easier for me to uh, keep it 
optimized. Uh, I think for the those four entities, it's a lot harder because the numbers are such so much larger. Just like in investing, you know, when you have much larger amounts to invest, uh, you really have to let go many things that would have been a great investment if you had much smaller amounts of capital to work with. So uh, let's talk about investing. Um, so as you set out on your value investing journey in 1994 and to where you are today, you clearly made more right than wrong investing uh, decisions. Have you ever made an investment decision so bad that it made you doubt whether you should be a professional investor? Well, uh, I've made a lot of investing mistakes. Uh, so that's just, I would say, par for the course. You know, um, John Templeton used to say that the best analyst will be right two out of three times. And uh, Peter Lynch said that, you know, if you're right 60% of the time, uh, you'll do really well. And uh, no one's going to be right 90% of the time. Uh, so uh, so even the Warren Buffetts and Charlie Mungers of the world uh, make plenty of investing mistakes. Uh, investing is hard because we have to look into the future. Uh, we have to look at a business and try to extrapolate what that business looks like five years or 10 years from now in the future. And uh, capitalism is brutal. So it's really hard to always be correct on that. Uh, but I've never, I've never felt with any mistake that this is not going to work. Uh, that I'm I'm in trouble or or anything like that. I think that uh, uh, one well, you know, uh, we are um, many of us who practice the art. We try to be perfectionists, right? Uh, we try really hard before we make an investment to dot all the i's, cross all the t's, run the checklist, and try to make sure that it won't come back to bite us in some way. But even after we do all that, uh, we'll still be wrong 30, 40, 50% of the time. And uh, and so that's the difficult part of our investing is that, uh, well, it's also, I would say it's also the thrilling part because it means you'll never master it, right? So uh, the, the goal is always to protect your downside. Uh, but no matter how much you try, uh, you're never going to be perfect at it. And uh, I mean, that downside always uh, is there. Uh, but, the, but the nature of investing is that uh, if, if, you're, if you make uh, a, a bunch of bets and they're made in the right, with the right frameworks, uh, a minority of the investments might uh, get you to the promised land. They say that the best things in life are free. Uh, do you think that's true in stock investing in, in, as well? Meaning, do fund managers who put more money behind research tools have a significant advantage compared to retail investors? Yeah, I don't. I don't think you get a big advantage by having a big team. Uh, I don't think that's uh, that's true in, in investing. I think in investing, what uh, what gives you an advantage first is the amount of capital you manage. The less you manage, the greater the, the advantage. The second big advantage is uh, how many decisions you make, how many investments you make, and the fewer the fewer investments that you make in a in a in a year or two, uh, the stronger your advantage because you'll be able to put your money against your very best ideas. So, if an investor is making you know one to three new investments a year versus another one who's making 10 or 20 investments a year, probably the person making the one to three investments will come out ahead. You know, uh, Buffett has this, you know, an imaginary punch card. He says that in a lifetime, you should think that you have this punch card, which you can punch only 20 times before you're out of punches. And each time you make an investment, you punch one one card, uh, one, one, one slot, right? And so what he's saying is that if, all investors were limited to 20 buy decisions in a lifetime, we would all become a lot better. Because you'd, you would think so hard about each time you, you use one of those punches. And I have a friend of mine, uh, he's, a, he's actually a doctor, but I think he's a really good investor. 
and he uses this punch card and sometimes he'll make an investment and he'll tell me monish that was one of the punches i used one of my 20 on that one and um, and he sticks with these things i mean he sticks with them for a long time done really well manish i wanted to talk to you about natural biases and uh, let me just give a give one example um something like investing in gold has never been easy for me and it's not just because you know buffett has spoken against it and it doesn't pay any pay any dividends or anything like that but more importantly growing up in denmark i never experienced demonetization uh, rapid inflation monetary instability in any kind of way um, however i have a i have a good friend in in india and and whenever i talk to him and some of his friends uh, gold is just perceived very differently and and i read that 11 of average household wealth is stored in gold and so my question to you is not about your view on gold per se, uh, but more about your personal experiences. Do you have any personal experiences, whether at childhood or or later, or just the way you grew up, that gives you a natural bias in any direction? Uh, I mean, I uh, you mean in terms of gold or in 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 terms of any of your investments? Uh, um, if you if if you have anything where you're like yes I know I'm prone to think that way I know it's probably a, perhaps it could be a mistake perhaps I don't see it but that's just how I was I was brought up so I have this natural bias to do X Y Z. Well, I would say one of my natural biases, which comes from very direct uh, experiences my father had and I had, is that um, entrepreneurship and business can be magical. Uh, what I what I mean by that is that my my father must have started about twenty different businesses uh, in maybe ten or fifteen industries in his in his entire career. Um, none of the businesses that he started took more than a few hundred dollars of capital to get going. Um, and you know, at that time, India didn't really have a venture capital industry, and the banks were pretty uh, pretty tough and so on. So uh, but but I saw some of those businesses uh, get some sizable scale, a uh, few hundred employees and so on. And and I saw how one person coming up with an idea without without having much resources was able to create an organization. And so that is the magic. I think that is the magic of entrepreneurship and that's the magic of business. And this something out of nothing is what is magical about capitalism, and uh, and when you look at you know what I would say quote unquote non productive assets like gold, um, I don't see that magic you know and that's what Buffett says that he says you could take all the gold in the world and melt it all down and you'd get a cube which is eighty feet on each side and he said you could go fondle it you could caress it you could polish it but it's not going to become one sixty feet on each side in ten years or 300 feet on each side, but a business. I mean, when Ray Kroc, you know, saw McDonald's and he went after it and he got all the franchisees and, you know, you saw the movie, The Founder. Uh, I mean, that is magic, okay? And, or what happened with Starbucks or any of these companies, you know, what happened with Microsoft is magic. And to me, uh, if we can, you know, ride their coattails, if we can have a piece of the action of these incredible magical businesses and just be patient and let it ride, um, you, you, could, uh, you could do extremely well, even if you're wrong six out of 10 times. Uh, because, because the magic that, uh, that you see happen with a Walmart or a Starbucks or a Microsoft or a Google is just amazing. And uh, that's what's amazing about capitalism. So gold or, you know, any of these kind of weird things which you look at it and say, either I don't understand it or it's, you know, uh, obviously not productive, um, you can just let them go. I'm happy that you brought up your, your father. Uh, it takes me to one of the other questions I prepared for you here today, because you previously here on the show back on episode 121 talked about how your father uh, was a serial entrepreneur. Uh, some of the businesses also didn't go as well. And you, you also said that you found this to be a blessing because 
um, you felt that at age 19, you had multiple MBAs because you had such an intense introduction to business and also at an age where like all these magical things happens to your brain and you're just ready to take in all this new information. And um, so you're in this situation where your daughter is now in their uh, mid twenties, one of them entrepreneur. Um, and so I can't, Whenever I, I think about your uh, story, the success you had, and also the upbringing, I was curious about how do you talk to your your daughters about investing in money, and what have you in general found to, if we talk about parenting, to, to be useful whenever you speak to your, your children about those topics? Well, I hardly spent any time uh, uh, talking to my daughters about investing. Uh, because I I uh, really wanted them to find their own calling in life, and I didn't I didn't think investing would be their calling in life. Uh, my younger daughter has zero interest in investing, and I think if I tried to talk to her about it, uh, she would just wonder why you know why are we talking about this something I'm not interested in. And um, the older one surprisingly is deeply interested. She started a fund recently. Uh, she's raising capital, and I think uh, she has um, probably a better temperament and better mental models than me. Um, and I think she'll do very well as an investor. Uh, so, with my older daughter, I've had plenty of conversations, and actually, I've learned a lot from those conversations um, because I just saw, you know, the way her natural biases were. Like her natural bias is to only buy great businesses. Uh, she's not a bargain hunter. She's a person who really likes to look for tremendous businesses. And then her second uh, great trait is that she has no desire to sell. Uh, so once she buys something, I, what I've seen is whatever's happening to the stock price or whatever, uh, it really doesn't affect her, which is a really, really good uh, these are really difficult things to teach. Uh, so I think in investing, uh, you know, your temperaments and your natural biases go a long ways. And what I see in terms of her with her natural biases is really good. So I think those two, those two frameworks, which is seeking out quality and then being extremely patient uh, with that quality. I mean, those are those are wonderful things. After after eight years of speaking with hundreds of investors, Manish, um, I've I finally decided to invest with one investor. So uh, starting April first, uh, it's no joke. Uh, I invested with Papri Funds, and uh, making that decision and it took me a very long time. Uh, it made me think of a lot of things that I look for in an asset manager. Uh, and I just want to say, disclaimer, Manish didn't ask me to say this, but I am going to say this. Uh, <laughs> because uh, I, I don't know if, if, if the audience is too interesting to hear about my process, but rather I want to hear about yours. So if if I could ask you as an asset manager, what would you look for in another asset manager? And if I could just constrain you here, let's say we have one scenario, you would have to put 10% of your net worth with that person. And then another scenario, it has to be 100% of your, uh, of your net worth in, in, uh, with another asset manager. Who would that be and, and why? Well, Stig, first of all, it was a, uh, it was a surprise. And uh, I, I felt a huge word of confidence that you uh, elected to, uh, to send, send some money our way. And, uh, and uh, I will be a great steward of your of your precious assets and I will do the best I can with them. So I think it'll be a good ride for you. I think, uh, Thank I think you'll you enjoy it. Um, you know, the, uh, the selection of an investment manager is a, is a difficult exercise. Uh, it's not an easy exercise because um, we want to see a long track record, but we also want to have the benefit of a long runway. So, if you pick someone who's in their 60s or 70s, 80s, then you know you have the benefit of looking at a very long track record, but you're not going to benefit too much from it because the runway may be very short. So we we need to find someone 
who's uh, got enough, you know, 10, 20 years of of historic record, which is uh, which is which is respectable, uh, and they are passionate, and there's a, a runway ahead. Um, so, I think I think Peter Kaufman uh, once talked about the five aces. Um, and I don't know if I can rattle off the five aces, but you know, uh, he's definitely looking for integrity. You know, the, uh, we have to, if I was looking for someone, they, they have to be very high integrity. Uh, I think they have to have enough history and they have to be relatively young so that there's a runway ahead. Um, the third is a alignment of interests, which is the, a fee structure that is, um, a win-win for the manager and the investor, and uh, and uh, another uh, another important trait is uh, their um, you know their temperament and just how they you've got to be able to understand the framework that they're using and whether you agree with that framework, right? So um, there are there are a number of different ways to skin the cat. And so you've got to make sure that you're in alignment uh, with the way the manager thinks. So I think those are the uh, those are the main uh, main things one should look for. Hey everybody, Trey Lockerbie here from We Study Billionaires, and I wanted to tell you about a new company that I absolutely love, and that is called Trade. Trade combines two of my favorite things: coffee and technology. So what you do is you go to drinktrade.com. There's a super simple survey that you take, and then it tells you which coffee they're going to send you that you are literally guaranteed to love. Meaning if you don't love it, they'll send you a new bag of coffee for free. And from there, you can keep experimenting so you're not falling into the same rut of drinking the same coffee over and over and over again. There are so many different types of roasters, levels of roast, beans from different parts of the world. There's plenty to nerd out on here. So why not be adventurous and try some new stuff? After I took the quiz, they sent me a bag from Sight Glass Coffee in Northern California, and it's literally my favorite coffee of all time. Normally, I've been drinking a coffee where I have to sweeten it with honey and almond milk, but this coffee, I could actually drink it black. It was so delicious just on its own. And right now, Trade is offering subscribers a total of $30 off your first order plus free shipping when you go to drinktrade.com slash TIP or click the link in the description below. That's more than 40 cups of coffee for free. Get started by taking the quiz at drinktrade.com slash TIP and let trade find the perfect coffee for you. That's drinktrade.com slash TIP for $30 off. Manish, there, there are many reasons why uh, I, I wanted to, to, to invest with you. Uh, and, and you mentioned uh, like Peter Kaufman's, some, some of those, uh, you know, a, a young man like, like yourself. But you know, it, it is, there is something to it. You know, that person should be old enough to have some experience and to have a track record. But you know, not to say anything bad about Warren or, 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 or Charlie, but you probably also would like another 20, 30 years of, of, of runway on top of that. Um, but what I, what I really like about uh, you, and I, you know, we, we've done this for eight years and we've been speaking with so many investors, is that I don't think I've met anyone who picks stock with the same level of conviction bets like you, which is one of many things I really liked. And I know you even restrain yourself to 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 some extent because you're you know you have a fund and and, and the, the way that works. Because as an investor, I don't want to invest in someone's fiftieth best idea. Um, you want to invest in the best idea. And you previously said here in the show that you generally want to make ten percent position bets, and then the winners run. And whenever I I read through your annual audit reports, I can see that you put your money where your, where your mouth is. Uh, I also heard you talk about how you personally, uh, in your own portfolio and for Dashina, have been running a more concentrated portfolio. What are your thoughts on setting up a fund where you only have one, two, or three stocks? After all, investors can just manage their you know, exposure, whatever you want to call it, and then thereby getting your highest conviction bet. What are your What are your thoughts on that compared to having, say, ten picks in your portfolio? I haven't uh, I haven't really thought about it that way, but I would I would say this that um, if anyone were to invest today with me, you know, in in my funds, um, even though we limit ourselves to ten percent bets, uh, the top three positions for 
I think all my funds are 50 to 60% of assets because they've, they've run up, right? So, so we bought Micron a few years back and it's doubled and so on. So um, if, if you had invested in me when I was starting out, uh, then yeah, we would not have the same degree of concentration because things haven't run up. But typically when investors have, have joined me, they've always come into a fund that uh, probably the top three positions are you know 40 to 60% uh, type concentration. And then by the time you get to the sixth or seventh position, you're looking at 90% of assets or something like that. And um, so we don't need to, uh, I don't think I need to um, start a fund and say, I'm gonna only have three picks. Um, I could do that, but I think that the nature of investing is such that it would get there anyway. And one of the things to keep in mind is there is this very high error rate, right? Uh, we, we've we talked about 40, 50% error rates. And so if you have 40, 50% error rate and you have three picks, uh, you could be wrong in two out of three of them, right? And if you're now wrong has a range of outcomes, right? Wrong means something could flatline, uh, just doesn't go anywhere or something is a 20% loss. Or wrong could also be permanent wipeout, zero uh, on that. And it, all of those are mistakes. So three bets could work as long as you don't have the wipeouts, right? I mean, I think you could have two, two of the three bets go sideways or be very modest winners, and one could carry you. That That's possible. Uh, but I don't think you need to uh, be uh, uh, be that way. But I would I would say this, you know, uh, sometimes we do get a chance to make investments where um, the odds are just so heavily stacked in your favor, and uh, and the the economics are so compelling uh, that that you would you would want to uh, you'd want to try to do more. Right. And so, so sometimes that can happen. I mean, I was, um, I was just thinking about, about this, that, um, in, uh, in 2019, I, uh, made this investment in this, uh, Turkish company, uh, called Resas. And in, uh, 25 years of investing, the situation with Resas never happened to me. And I don't think it'll happen to me again till I pass away. I think this is a max once in a lifetime. So Resas was a situation where a business which was worth something like $600 million uh, liquidation value, not even intrinsic value, just could sell everything and quickly get $600 million, um, was available for $20 million. Uh, so you were able to get a dollar bill for three cents. Um, so and 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 it was a dollar bill that was likely to grow because they're really good capital allocators. So this wasn't just some Ben Graham type, you know, ultra cheap net net where the dollar would just sit at a dollar or maybe might even decline to eighty cents. This dollar might be worth five dollars in ten or twenty years, and you we were paying three cents for it, right? And any way I looked at it, I really couldn't see a way that we would lose money. It was just, it looked extremely bulletproof from a number of different ways I looked at it. But I still have to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, there's the 40, 50% error rate always there. But if, if, I were, if I were not running a fund and I came across this investment, I would have no trouble putting a third of my net worth into it uh, because I just think that something like that being one out of three bets, I would make that bet all day long just because I, what I saw in terms of downside versus upside. Uh, so sometimes that can make sense. Um, but like I said, a, a race has happened to me only once in a quarter century. So we can't really kind of build a framework around it. Uh, Chuck Acree, you know, who's a great investor, 
uh, he he says that in his lifetime of investing he's had two 100 baggers uh one of them was Berkshire Hathaway which he started buying in the 80s uh, early to mid 80s and the second was American Tower uh both of these ended up being 100 baggers and you know like I said I think in a lifetime uh in a portfolio you cannot expect to have more than one two or three hundred baggers you know that's pretty much i think the limit of what might happen but even if you run a you know 10 by 10 portfolio and one of your bets uh ends up being like that uh, that's why the error rate doesn't matter so much in the case of in the case of uh resas uh we were running about 600 million or so in capital and all we could invest in the company was 7 million 7 million got us one third of the company right so in effect it was like a one percent bet now i wanted that bet to be larger right and uh but that's all we could put in because the market cap is 20 million and and that was that but but the thing is that that uh one third uh and you know i think the value of the business has gone up maybe a couple of hundred million at this point in the last two three years um so uh to me what is very simple and what is very important is that we never touch race us uh, unless there is something which is, you know, there's an integrity issue or something comes up from left field. I just hope I'm smart enough to sit here 20 years and not touch that position. And uh, I just want to cheer them on from the sidelines. So uh, so that's, uh, I think that's my way of thinking about concentration. I think you don't need to go to three stocks. Uh, I think you'll get there uh, normally just even with a 10, 12 stock portfolio. Forgive me, Manus, I had to, I had to ask because of your the, the influence of Nick Sleep and and how he saw those three businesses, uh, which, was, which was very interesting. So I was just very curious to hear how you thought about that uh, that now. So so thank you for your elaboration on that. Um, One thing, you know, we uh, just, just on Nick Sleep is if you think about the three businesses he put all of his money into, uh, Amazon, Costco, and Berkshire. These three businesses have a few things in common. Uh, one of the things they have in common is they have a really strong and admirable culture. Uh, each of these three businesses is very different, but the culture is really strong. Uh, also, all three of them have incredible moats, unbelievable moats. And, and the third is they have incredible leadership. So, you know, if you think about the three bets that Nick Sleep made, uh, it's hard to improve on them. It's hard to get to a higher quality business than Costco or Berkshire. It's just really hard to do that. Um, so I think that um, when I look at what Nick did and then he rode off into the sunset and, you know, hung up his boots, uh, I think there was a lot of thought that went into. Uh, so it wasn't it wasn't the number three that was so critical. It is which were the three, and why was it? Why why did he pick those three? And I think that's uh, that's where the genius comes in. So it's oh. kind of like you know in 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 the late eighties, Buffett put like I think thirty percent of Berkshire's total net worth into a single stock. He put a, you know, 30% into Coke, right? And it, it, was, a, it was a very big bet uh, for Berkshire. Uh, but the conviction level was so high, right? And it, it worked out spectacularly for them. Uh, so once in a while, you know, these things line up. I mean, a, a business like Coke uh, is so resilient, such an amazing business um, that, you know, Warren, when he finally figured it out, he just bought every share he could. 
I mean, you're you're doing the job uh, for me here, Manus, because I wanted to talk about uh, Turkey and Coke. So we didn't plan for this, but this is <laughs> this is absolutely amazing. So uh, you're uh, you're investing in developing countries with uh, high inflation rates, and um, one way to mitigate that is to invest in companies that have fixed and recurring payments in more established currencies such as the euro or the dollar. And one could could uh, mention Racist Logistics as an example, but it's not so much the specific company, but just more about your process this question goes to. Um, on that note, I, I heard you say in this wonderful Q&A you did with the Value School in Madrid, Spain, back July 9th, that you uh, were not too concerned about the currency depreciation in Turkey. And you had this example of using a Coke bottler as an example, and you walked through an example of, of the pricing power of that. Uh, but could you talk to, to us more about not just only the revenue side, but the cost side? Uh, like, how do we value the cost side of a company who is situated in a, in a country where they have secular inflation pressures? Yeah, it's a great question. So Turkey, uh, Turkey is, uh, inflation is running at about 50% a year in Turkey. I do not believe that the 50% number will come down uh, meaningfully, even if there is regime change. So even if Erdogan, there's an election next year and you know some new leader comes in and the new leader is very concerned about inflation, even in that scenario, uh, it will be very difficult to really bring it down. I mean, they may be able to bring it down five, 10% a year. It may take them five or 10 years more to bring it down to something like 20% or low. So inflation uh, is really hard. Uh, and the reason it's hard to bring it down is because what has happened in, in Turkey and what's happened in many other countries is the government has a certain level of expenditure and they have transfer payments going on to large portions of the population. And they stay in power because of those payments. So you cannot just come in one day and say, oh, I'm going to balance the budget by just cutting all these transfer payments because next day you will be out of power because those voters will not keep you. So um, what we had happen in the United States with Paul Walker in the early 80s where he took a sledgehammer and you know, US treasuries went to 18% and he brought it, he broke the back of inflation. Uh, is really hard to do in democracies. Um, it's almost impossible to do. So that's why what Volker did was amazing. So our investment in Turkey uh, was made under the premise that 50% inflation is there, let's say, forever. Okay. Um, we also, I also assumed that not only will there be 50% inflation because of the way the currency will react, the lira will devalue up accordingly. So for example, in 2019, when we made the investment in Resas, it was five lira to $1. Uh, now, less than three years later, it's 15 lira to $1. A year from now, I would forecast it'll be 22 lira to $1. And two years from now, it'll be 33 lira to $1. And even when those things take place, we will do really well on our investment. And what has happened in the last three years is when we've gone from five to 15, uh, in dollars, we have quadrupled our money in RESAS. It's like a 4X in the last three years. In local currency, it's even more, but who cares about that? Uh, so why did that happen? Why, why, how can you invest in a high inflation environment and still do well? Uh, so there are businesses in Turkey where the revenues are in euros and the expenses are in lira. There's a sliver of businesses which are like that. What has happened in Turkey because of all this turmoil, everyone and their brother has left the country. All the foreign investors have exited. Everyone's gone. Only Monish has gone in. Okay. Which is, and it's the cheapest market in the world. That's why I went in because I just couldn't, I, I thought it was ridiculous the way the market was priced, still ridiculously priced. 
So, for example, there's a juice manufacturer in Turkey. We don't have any position in the juice manufacturer. 98% of their products are exported to the European Union. Turkey is part of the European common market. They can export ed- anything to Europe with no duties or tariffs. And so all their costs are in lira. And all their revenues are in euros. Their profits are at all-time highs because... In a high inflation environment, one of the things that happen is wages do not keep up. So Turkish citizens are becoming poorer because inflation is running 50% and maybe their wages might be going up 20 or 30%, but not 50%. So this company has a workforce where in euros, their, their payroll costs are shrinking. And even even when they buy produce and buy fruits and all of that to make into juices, th- those are not keeping up with inflation or not keeping up with the, with the euro revenue. So uh, we limited ourselves to businesses in Turkey that have this weird tailwind. Okay, so there are businesses in Turkey where all revenue is in euros. And large portions of the expenses are in lira. And because the baby got thrown out with the bathwater, investors don't care about those businesses. They just look at that it's Turkey. And some you know manager in New York just picks up the phone and tells us his people exit Turkey completely. Right. And and that's why you get uh this weird mispricing. Uh so in the case of Resas, what, 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 what I found is that there was an asset base which was worth like a billion dollars, these 12 million square feet of warehouses. Those warehouses are land, cement, concrete, steel, etc. cetera. Okay? Um, those are all inflation indexed. Okay, so when you have 50% inflation, the land price is going up, the steel price is going up, the replacement cost of these warehouses is going up. So Resas as a company sees its rents go up pretty dramatically, but the CapEx was done in yesterday's, yesterday's Lira. They're not doing much CapEx anymore. So their billion dollar asset base is not becoming worth less than a billion because there's an international price for steel and cement and concrete and the replacement cost is going to adjust and the rent is adjusting so if if i own if i own an apartment building in austin okay and i bought that apartment building for 1 million dollars and after 5 years it costs 5 million dollars to build that building i still paid only 1 million but the rents will be based on the 5 million so the rent is going to go up dramatically so so someone like me who paid a million is going to be looking really good. The rent is going to look good because I paid in yesterday's. And not only that, uh, RESAS, because the government tries to keep the interest rate so low, uh, the their, their borrowing cost is 14% average. They have very little borrowing, but they're borrowing at 14% in lira. Uh, and their rents are going up at least 20 to 30%. So, even even uh, if the rents are not keeping up with inflation, they're twice their borrowing costs, and they hardly have any debt, so it doesn't matter. But so what I'm trying to say is that um, a lot of businesses in Turkey are not investable because uh, in a high inflation environment, uh, investors are going to have a lot of trouble. Uh, but there are a sliver of them. Uh, where they where the economics work out really well. You talked about the Coke bottler. So I was in Istanbul for three weeks earlier this year. I had a great time. You know, the blue fish on the Bosphorus, the banks of the Bosphorus grilled is really good. And I, I met the Coke bottler in Turkey. And uh, when I met them the first time, I told them, uh, by the way, they're very high quality people uh, just I was just impressed with the the quality of the operation. They're really, really a blue chip firm. And they're 20% owned by the Coca-Cola company. So I told them, listen, uh, I did a talk a few years back at UC Irvine 
on Coca-Cola. It's a two hour talk. Uh, if you just Google me and Coca-Cola, the talk will come up. Why don't you guys, uh, you guys might enjoy, you know, watching that. So they did, they actually went and watched uh, the talk. Then they contacted me and said, Monish, we are your greatest fans. We love you so much. Okay. So then uh, I actually had some more questions for them after the first meeting. I said, listen, can we meet again? Okay. They said, of course, we want to meet you as many times as you want to meet us because we want, you know, and, and just the second time I met them for lunch, uh, they are asking me what their strategy should be. Okay. <laughs> you know, I'm not in the bottling business. Okay. But they thought they never met an investor who understood Coke as well as I did. And, um, uh, and and just to tell you how how amazing that business is. So they they own bottling rights in about twelve different countries. It's not just Turkey. Uh, they have forty nine percent of the bottling rights of Coke in Pakistan. Okay, Pakistan is not some you know Mickey Mouse country. It's a large two hundred million people, very hot country where people like to drink Coke, and Coke has fifty percent market share. And at some point, the Coca-Cola company, which owns 51%, will probably sell that 51% to these guys. Maybe it happens in two years or three years or whenever, okay? So they have operations all over the, uh, in all these, you know, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, all these different places, uh, Jordan, Syria, whatever, they have Coke bottlers and all these places which this company owns. So again, you know, when I look at their Lira exposure, yeah, Turkey is a big market, but you know, something like 60% of their revenue is outside Turkey. And and uh, and and that's increasing. So and and that business is inflation indexed. So they have the ability to raise prices and and they do raise prices as they as they need to to uh, to keep up. And and a business like that, uh, I think you could invest in and you would do very well. Thank you for sharing that story, uh, Manjus. That was that's absolutely amazing. It must be must be wonderful <laughs> to to go and meet people like that. Um, so, uh, Manjus, I know that uh, generally you don't talk too much about your uh, your current positions, and so so thank you for for sharing about racist logistics. I think that was very insightful, uh, and it's also very understandable that you don't want to do that and and be susceptible to confirmation bias. Uh, sometimes you are willing to talk about previous positions. So I wanted to hear if you would be willing to share some thoughts on Alibaba. Oh, sure. Yeah. So um, we invested in Alibaba. I think Alibaba is an uh, incredible, amazing business. It's done really well uh, over the long time. But then uh, after I made the investment, I was able to complete our, our research and drill down on Tencent. And when I compared the two investments uh, and companies, Alibaba and Tencent, I felt that Tencent was a superior business. Um, and, you know, that was a perception I had. And Alibaba had gone down significantly from where we had bought it. And we always, at you know, at year end, we want to do tax planning so that if we have uh, positions that have declined, we, we need to look at whether we need to do a tax loss selling and then maybe buy it back after 30 days. It's always a complicated decision because given my luck, the stock will move within those 30 days and then we get hosed. Uh, but in the case of uh, Alibaba and Tencent is I could sell Alibaba and five minutes later buy Tencent, right? So I didn't have this 30-day waiting period where normally in tax loss selling, I need to sell all the Alibaba, have a 30 or 31-day period where we don't buy anything and then buy it back to capture the tax loss. And in this case, we were able to do it right away because it's a different security. And so I was able to kill two birds with one stone. One is that we captured the tax loss. And the second is we, I think we got into a better position, uh, a business that I thought was better. So that's that's why we, we did what we did. And specifically for for Tencent, uh, I heard you say that Tencent might be the best um, 
uh, of the big tech companies, and then perhaps Amazon would be number two because they're so much better at allocating capital. I don't want want you to sound like a broken record, especially not for your hardcore fans who, like me, have gone through all of that that material. But I I just felt it was it was so insightful that I, I would kindly ask you to share that with uh, with our listeners. It's it's very very insightful. Yeah, well, I mean, I think one thing to keep in mind with both Alibaba and Tencent, which which gave me pause is these are mega caps, okay? So these are, you know, companies worth hundreds of billions of dollars, right? And so anytime you buy a business which is hundreds of billions of dollars, how much runway is there, right? That always comes up. I mean, like, you know, Apple is like three trillion or whatever, but how many companies become trillion plus market cap? Or, you know, there's zero company that five trillion market cap, for example. So there's always an issue of runway that comes up in my mind is how big can these things get? Whereas when I look at a business like Resas at 20 million market cap, uh, we can see a very long runway, right? Because just liquidation value was a billion. So, so one thing to keep in mind is that we may do well, I mean, investors may do well with Tencent or with Alibaba, but you are starting, your starting point at these companies is that they already have significant size and scale. And so you have to keep it in, in, in mind. Uh, but having said that, you know, uh, they have, uh, I mean, Tencent has, um, uh, I mean, I think that the two engines they have in, in the company, one is, uh, their army of software engineers, which, uh, they are able to very nimbly move into different areas and, uh, the return on invested capital you get, I mean, you know, uh, WeChat was created by probably 20 people, okay? So if you think about, you know, the revenues and profits that come out of WeChat versus maybe like, you know, $10 million or something that went into it, it's just, you know, it's like asymmetric to the power of asymmetric. Uh, so when we are making digital investments into these large scalable uh, businesses where you have the intellectual property, uh, the returns can be spectacular. So Tencent has done really well in the video game business. They they dominate in the video game business globally. Uh, they dominate in messaging. And wherever they've put their attention, uh, they've done really well. And of course, because they're in the software business, you cannot put much capital in the software business because you know there's only so many engineers you need to do whatever you want to do. And so they've been really good at taking the excess capital and building a second leg, which most companies don't have. Most companies do not have investing prowess. Um, and Tencent built incredible investing prowess amongst great uh, private businesses that they could uh, take a stake in and uh, use that excess cash and the, the returns they've generated on that portfolio has been spectacular. I think it's in the 30, 40 plus percent annualized return rate. It's a really spectacular return. So they get very high returns on invested capital when they hire software engineers. That's just off the charts. But even when they invest in a Meet One or, or uh, you know, JD.com or C or whoever else they're investing in globally, uh, they've generated very high returns. So I think the combination of these two uh, is incredible. Now, of course, one of the things that's come up for both Tencent and Alibaba is the Chinese government considers all of this Wild West behavior not acceptable. And they've been putting curbs on them. Uh, and so the question is, so businesses are very... Uh, I would say most businesses are very fragile. If you if you start, you know, shaking up the core kind of underlying premise of foundations of who they sell to and how they sell and how they market and and how they get revenue, uh, most businesses would have a very hard time with that, and and they would be in trouble. Uh, so I think both Tencent and Alibaba need to. Uh, understand this new landscape. And the, one of the problems with understanding the new landscape has been that it's been shifting. The, the CCP will come up with certain guidelines and changes. 
And then you think, okay, they're done. Then after two months, they come up with more guidelines and more changes. Then you think you're done and then they keep going. And, um, but for what I have, what I have seen of the behavior of Tencent and even Alibaba, uh, they are adapting really well. Uh, so I think Tencent will shift its focus very heavily away from China. They've already had a global footprint, both on their video games and their investing. And so I think that footprint will become even more global and they will de-emphasize certain businesses in China. That's my best guess. Uh, or they will look at businesses which are non-controversial, like the, uh, you know, the cloud business and so on. So that's that's what I expect would happen. Whenever I I looked into to Alibaba and and took a position, uh, you know, of course, one had to look into all these things about the listing and all the things that came out, and then CCP said one thing, and then they said another thing, and it, it was confusing for for everyone. But um, whenever you have these ADRs, even even if this V uh, EIE uh, thing will be will be banished, like you would still own these stocks. So I. I was wondering uh, for for investors investing in China um, and for someone like you, are you looking into buying them at the exchange in Hong Kong instead of buying it in America? Is it a regulation thing to do one or, or the other? I I don't think one needs to sweat that. I think the VIE structure and uh, yeah, I think that uh, if you have a choice, you're better off buying it in Hong Kong. I think that's that's fine. Uh, but I don't, I don't have a concern about the VIE structure. I don't have a concern that the ownership is like quicksand. Uh, you know, it might shift or change. I don't have those concerns. I think um, if investors run into issues, it will be because of the core business. Uh, it won't be because of the structure. So I think if 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 investors are correct about where the core business is in a few years, uh, they will do fine. And if they are uh, not right on that, then they'll pay the price. So um, I don't, and then in fact, recently, even the Chinese government has been pretty cooperative uh, about the uh, the company sharing data uh, in the US uh, to enable the US listings and so on to stay in place. So uh, even, even they have, uh, shown a degree of cooperation, which surprised me. Manis, the the last question I have uh, for you here today. You've been you've been very very generous with your time, so so thank you for that. Uh, you have these wonderful Q and As with students that you upload on YouTube, and uh, one of the most common questions that you get is, um, you know, students ask about the circle of competence, and you rightly say that asking the question is also answering the question. So if you ask, is this within my circle of competence? Well, it's probably not, because why would you ask the question then? So fearing that I would walk into the same trap here, uh, we previously uh, talked about here on the show how we learn differently whenever we have a position in the stock compared to just doing research on the stock. And I've found that to be true. Uh, Therefore, the question remains, uh, when do we know that we know enough to build a position in the first place. You know, you really learn about a company after you own it. And you learn a lot about the company after it drops 50% after you own it. That's that's when you truly understand the business. (laughs) Okay, so whatever gaps you have in your understanding will become crystal clear at that point. So that's the unfortunate part. Some of these lessons can be very expensive. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that, I think the, the the nature of investing, like I said, I think that the kinds of factors that affect a business uh, are so myriad. I mean, they're so broad. Things can come from left field. And so uh, that's what makes this, such an exciting and challenging endeavor is um, is that you know these things will always uh, surprise you. Uh, sometimes the surprise is very heavily in your favor, and uh, sometimes the surprise can be uh, a negative surprise. Uh, but I think that if you have a curiosity and um, and you 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 pay attention to circular competence and you pay attention to do you really understand the business and and those sorts of things. 
um, it can be really helpful. Manish, uh, as always, it's it's always so much so much fun to have these these conversation. Uh, you know, once a year, that's you know, it's like it, time just flies so fast, and it seems like nothing happens. Then I look at you, and I look at your office, and I'm like, oh my god, so many things has has happened. You've gotten so much bling on your <laughs> on your wall. So I would encourage everyone to check out the YouTube video, and they can see uh, Manish's a uh, bling on on the wall. Um, I will. I just want to say that uh, it's it's always uh, an honor uh, speaking with you, Manus. Uh, I'm actually going to to tell the audience that I'm going to to record a specific interview or a specific episode with my friends Hari Ramachandra and Toby, Tobias Carlyle on that will be published on May 21st, where we're going to talk more in detail about Popri funds. Um, but um, Manish won't be here, so <laughs> I just want to say that's my disclaimer. But I'm I'm very intrigued. I'm I'm very fascinated about Parai funds and all these disclaimers. I don't get paid or anything like that. But I am I am investing with with Manish, which is an absolute privilege. So I just wanted to to say that we are creating an episode around it in case people are are interested in why the decision was made. Having said all of that, Manish, uh, where can the audience learn more about you and Parai funds? I mean, I think God God Google can help them. Uh, so uh, I think you can just you can just Google me and uh, uh, the website and such will come up. So that's uh, that's a pretty easy way to go. Uh, but I would also say, Stig, uh, this time our interaction was special because uh, you are now a partner, and uh, and uh, and uh, our fortunes are a little bit tied at the hip, which makes me very happy. And uh, so uh, I'm grateful for the for the word of confidence. So thank you. Well, well, thank you for, for saying so, uh, Manus, and and thank you for for spending uh, a little more than an hour here with us here today. So thank you so much for your your time. All right, my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 